So first, a little bit about Murray Morgan. I'm going to tell a lot of people in this room things that they already know, but maybe some people don't know. Murray Morgan was known as the Dean of Northwest History in his lifetime. He was a journalist and historian. He was Tacoma born and bred. He was the author of more than 20 books, including The Well-Loved Skid Road, Puget Sound, and The Last Wilderness. Murray got his start as a national journalist. He worked for Time Magazine, the New York Herald Tribune, CBS News, and other outlets, but he decided he wanted to come home and write about the Northwest, and that's what he did. Our next eminent personage is Lane Morgan. She is the author of books including Greetings from Washington and the Winter Harvest Cookbook, co-author of Seattle A Pictorial History, the Pacific Northwest, The Beautiful Cookbook, boy, I'd like that one, and The Miracle Planet. She is an adjunct professor of journalism at Western Washington University and a contributor to historylink.org. She's born in Tacoma, lives in Bellingham, and she is the daughter of Murray Morgan. Our third panelist is Jim Lynch. Jim is Olympia-based. He's the author of four novels. His latest, Before the Wind, was picked as one of the best novels of the year by the Wall Street Journal and the American Library Associ Association and became a 2018 bestseller in France. I hope there were some benefits that accrued from that. Um, his 2012 novel, Truth Like the Sun, told the story of another pivotal era in Seattle history, the 1962 World's Fair. The Seattle Times said of Lynch that he observes like a journalist and writes like a poet. Actually, I said that. <laughs> All right, it wouldn't be a 21st century presentation if we didn't have some visuals. So we're going to have a quick slideshow here. The first are uh, some pictures of Murray. Lane is going to provide a little commentary and then some quickly some photos from Skid Road. Okay, we're going to pray this works. All right. As it says, Stadium High School, 1933. My mom thought, who was already his girlfriend, thought he looked like a movie star. He was so cute. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> this is on their honeymoon on the Danube in 1939. Um, on the Hungarian plain, the letter says, and on his shoulder is a baby cuckoo that some of the folks nearby gave to him along with a bunch of um, maggots to feed it. <laughs> and his ever-present portable typewriter, which they were carrying in a ki folding kayak. I remember <coughs> reading uh, material for the forward that they, neither of them had ever actually paddled a kayak and they decided to float the Danube. I thought that was pretty gutsy. This is probably fall of 1943, shortly before Murray was shipped out to the Aleutians. His father, Henry Victor Morgan, who was a Tacoma pastor, is on the seated. His half-brother, Victor Henry, who was also a pastor for the uh, Pacific Fleet, is in the middle, and Murray's on the right. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> About couple years after Skid Road came out, early 50s, um, in the studio at Trout Lake, which is where he wrote everything he wrote after 1946. Same studio 20 or so years later, um, a little fuller of books and one of the many photos taken of him by Mary Randlett. Mary Randlett, who was a wonderful photographer of artists and writers in the Northwest, just passed away a couple of weeks ago, so, yeah. yeah. And here is another Mary Randlett photo. Another Mary Randlett, Murray on the top of Old City Hall in Tacoma, same general time period, pro possibly promo for Puget Sound. Um, and Mary loved telling how she had to coax him, coax him toward the edge because he had a fear of heights. <laughs> All right. 
looks, this is a great photo, very windswept. All right, now we're gonna segue into Skid Road photos. Here's the guy who, in my opinion, is the heart and soul of this book. David S. Doc Maynard, we'll get into him a little bit later. This photo was taken, taken in commercial photographer E.M. Samus studio in what is now Pioneer Square in 1864. 1864. Did, did I say? Did, oh my goodness, well thank you. Okay, so same studio, same photographer, same year, here's Chief Seattle. The only picture of Chief Seattle as far as we know that was ever taken. I'm looking at David Burgey. He's kind of going, yeah. yeah. Oh, he says there's one more. Okay. One of the very few <laughs> photographs that was ever taken of Chief Seattle. In Skid Road, uh, Chief Seattle and Doc Maynard, um, they have a lot of uh, interaction, and um, they both affected each other's lives. I think that's fair to say. Here is Yesler's Mill, which looks junky and down at the hills, but the fact that Yesler was able to get the mill going when no other town around Puget Sound had a mill was responsible for kind of the early growth sport of Puget Sound. This is a stereopticon photo by George Moore taken in 1871. Here we are we're standing, I think, on what today is the corner of First Avenue and Yesler Way, is that correct? And what you see, the Skid Road, is now Yesler, and you can see just how unprepossessing Seattle was at that point. Many, many chapters to unfold for Seattle. Also by George Moore, the guy with the stereopticon. Here is a very interesting chapter in the book. We like to think of Seattle as a, a bastion of progressivism and light, you know, sweetness and light. But this was a public lynching that occurred. In 1882, uh, three men who were accused of murdering a Seattle policeman and a grocery clerk were, um, a mob broke into the jail and despite the sheriff's attempts to beat them off, strung them up. This is the kind of material Murray loved. Um, another chapter, this is the era when Seattle working people got very upset that Chinese people were working and, and taking jobs away from them. Does this sound familiar? Um, so there was uh, a riot and the Chinese were driven out of their homes and down on the dock and Seattle's home guard rallied to protect them, although the, the rest of the story is not that happy. That was kind of a pivotal moment. Great Seattle fire just starting, torched most of the city. This was a Beacon Hill brothel. This building was constructed during Seattle's most wide open vice ridden period, which Murray has great fun with in the story. It was designed to accommodate 250 women. But finally the people of Seattle had had enough. Um, the mayor, Hiram Gill, who was all like behind the brothel was recalled. The brothel was never open, but many other brothels were open and remained open. I think we got one more, ah. Last photo, Skid Road ha is, is wonderful in the era of vaudeville and nightclub life in Seattle, and I love this photo just for its sheer uh, life. These are showgirls at the Metropolitan Theater at the Olympic Hotel. They played wild animals in the play Robinson Crusoe, 1916. All right, now Lane, you're going to tell us a little bit about how Skid Road came to be. 
And this shouldn't take long because I don't actually know a tremendous amount of detail. There's my short crib sheet. Um, but I can say that by the late 40s, Murray and my mom were back in Tacoma, Seattle area in 47. They had bought their house on Trout Lake in extreme South King County. Um, <coughs> and he had decided that he wanted to make his writing focus regional. He'd been to, New to back east twice, uh, to New York for graduate school at Columbia in 1941 and back in D.C. after the war was over to finish out his military service working in the Library of Congress. And it was clear to him that he, although paths were open to New York journalism, he'd worked for Time, he'd worked for the New York Herald Tribune, and had lots of opportunities to try that out, that let he me, wanted just, to be can back. Can everybody hear okay? Can you hear back there? Okay. You're okay? So speak up a little bit louder and keep the mic <coughs> close to your mouth. So he had made a decision to be back at home and then he had to figure out how to pay for that. And at the time that Skid Road was being written, he was teaching writing classes at what's now University of Puget Sound and working as a bridge tender on the 11th Street Bridge, now the Murray Morgan Bridge in Tacoma, and hauling probably that same portable typewriter up the stairs to the bridge tender shack so that he could type at night they don't open that bridge, did not very often. So. I think they opened it once, didn't they, during <laughs> yes. this whole time? Yeah, there. there's an epic story of him trying to open it, but yeah. generally you could get a lot of writing done. Um, he told people at that period that he was getting tired of teaching, and he felt that the first few years when his students were his peers and they were mostly people on the GI Bill, many of whom had not finished high school, let alone planned originally to go to college, and they were a fascinating collection of characters, and he felt very comfortable teaching that. And then he said, oh, that wave sort of passed, and everybody wanted to work for Weyerhaeuser and have a picket fence and two cars, and I got bored. And he <laughs> so, But he also knew by then he didn't really like um, what he called group journalism. He would prefer not to be on a newspaper staff or a magazine staff. He would rather freelance. S and at that point, he um, <coughs> was deputized to drive Malcolm Cowley, the famous East Coast editor, around. He came out to give what was a controversial lecture at UW, controversial because he had been a party member of the Communist Party, and he'd written some steamy poetry, and he was otherwise thought by a lot of people not to be suitable for the young minds of UW students. Um, but he and Murray got along great. And Murray he drove him around. Murray drove him around. Yeah. He took him out on the peninsula. He told him swashbuckling stories of the Northwest. And Malcolm was a real East Coast guy. This was a revelation to him, the whole Seattle Northwesty scene. Um, shortly after that, he was working in, um, at Stanford, teaching writing in Palo Alto, and there's a uh, quote from him in a letter where he says, the people in Palo Alto are nice, but not so amusing as those in Seattle. They don't drink or talk so much, and they keep an eye on academic advancement, whereas the Seattle people had almost abandoned hope or fear. <laughs> So he said to Murray, you know, you could make these stories you're telling me into a book. I think that's a fabulous idea. And then he said, actually, you could make them into two books. Do one about Seattle, then do one about this amazing hunk of forest out on the peninsula. Mm -hmm. And that's what became Last Wilderness. And Murray credited him with turning his repertorial instincts into something more sustained. It wasn't his first book, but it was his first big more thought through, more planned out yeah, nonfiction book. He was a great editor, I've read. He, Murray certainly thought so. He said, that, you know, and he mostly sort of taught himself, but when he got to Malcolm Cowley, he said, this is the guy who showed me how you can take this people-based kind of storytelling and take it past just yarns into history. Let's, let's talk about those people. I mean, this was not the hall of notables approach 
to the city's history. <coughs> this was people who were, they were into graft, they were into nightlife, they were like Doc Maynard, you know, uh, somebody who tried many things and never really succeeded at any of them. Now, why did Murray decide to make those people the focus of Skid Road? He said that, um, well, first of all, he just liked folks like that. He liked folks like <laughs> that. I figured it was something he like that. He um, said Skid Road started from Considine, John Considine, the box house guy, Doc Maynard, Dave Beck, people like that. I try to make the book develop from the lives of real people. He sa somebody said, oh, this is such a romantic book you know, all these characters and all this stuff. And I remember he said once, I don't think I'm romantic. I think I, you could say I'm sentimental and that I tend to fall in love with my characters even if they're jerks and get involved in their struggles. And so people who had those kinds of struggles and their struggles were out front and center just appealed to him. Um, I don't think it was the low life as such, but mm -hmm. just that those were the sorts of people who fascinated him and he liked to spend time with both as a researcher and as a human. And those, in a lot of ways, were the people that inhabited early Seattle. I mean, they were people looking for the main chance, people who'd mm -hmm. kind of washed up from someplace else. Yeah. I mean, there's certainly the cliche, and David would know better, a lot of other people here would know better than I if how much is in it that the, as people came west, the folks who wanted to sort of recreate back east stayed in Portland and in the Willamette, and the folks who wanted things a little looser since there was less government up here headed north. <laughs> Indeed. I want to focus for a second on one of those people, Doc Maynard, probably my favorite character in this book. And I, since Murray's not here to read for himself, I just want to read a tiny, tiny little excerpt from the book. Doc Maynard tried to get rich and instead brought wealth to others. Doc was the first of the dreamers along the skid road. He was Seattle's first booster, the man who was sure greatness could come. He owned a tract of land where city officials guess $100 million. That was in 1951. <laughs> Wrapped in his dream of making Seattle grow, he gave it bit by bit to anyone whose presence might help the town expand. Seattle grew, but by the time it was big, Maynard was dead, and the government had taken most of the property he left to his wife. He died poor, but he was a great man. Maynard was a man of parts, a warm human being whose worst faults grew out of his greatest virtue, his desire to be helpful. And few people ever got into more trouble trying to help others. Wow, that guy could write. I mean, there are so many, so many sections of Skid Road that just sort of knock me out. He could take, he could take dry facts, stream them together into a wonderful narrative, and then pow, at the end, he would just say something that just kind of grabbed you. And now I'm going to ask Jim Lynch to comment on that. What made Murray such a great writer? Um, if you agree that he was I, a great writer. I will writer. attempt to... to uh, answer that, but I'm, I'm curious, first off, how m what percentage of the people here have, have read Skid Road? Is it like you, you had to have read it to get in the building? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, I, I appreciate the question because I've been asking myself that, uh, trying to pinpoint why I think Murray Morgan is so good and so many people find him so good. Um, and I first read him in college for pleasure, and it's maybe one of the very few history books I've read for pleasure. And, I, and I, was, I was dazzled by how fun he made Seattle's history. Uh, and then I read him preparing to write a novel about Seattle, and um, that was more utilitarian, but again, I was amazed. And then I just read him in the last week 
um, to, to, to grasp him again. And, and uh, I kind of came to the conclusion that he's kind of the uh, Pacific Northwest Steinbeck. Um, I think he has a lot of the, the sentiments and style of Steinbeck. If Steinbeck had been writing regional history around Monterey, I think it would have read kind of like um, Murray here. And um, there, there's a, the, oh, and especially um, Steinbeck's novel, Cannery Row, which came out in 45, and, and Skid Road is 51 when, it, when he finished the, the first printing of it. And so um, there's elements of, of, of Steinbeck that, that I just uh, feel an echo. Uh, in the opening page of uh, Cannery Row, Steinbeck writes about the inhabitants of, uh, of uh, Monterey, and he says, uh, its inhabitants are, as the man once said, whores, pimps, gamblers, and sons of bitches, by which he meant everybody. Had the man looked through another peephole, he might have said saints and angels and martyrs and holy men, and he would have meant the exact same thing. And I just kind of feel that that was Murray's view of humanity as well. Um, and so I, I, do, th I do think that, that Murray is, is kind of one of the, the great writers of his of his generation. I don't really see that as overstatement. But, you know, breaking down what makes him so good, I, I tried to, uh, um, I tried to do that as best I could, and I just like to rattle off some examples of things that I think he does so well. Uh, for starters, I think it's the choice he makes on which people he focuses on. Um, it's as if he took a big sweeping look at Seattle's history and focused on the people who amused him and who fit into that view of his humanity and, and the city. His characters have, they all have these uh, dramatic story arcs. They boom and they bust just like the city. Doc Maynard, John Constantine, Erastus Brainerd, Anna Louisa Strong, Dave Beck, they all have that, that, uh, that boom and bust element to them. And he picks these moments that reveal and define the city, the inhumane way that we dealt with the Indians and the Chinese, our response to the fire, the gold rush, the general strike. But none of it would work so well if he didn't so playfully and fearlessly and convincingly reimagine history. He did it so well, it feels like he's looking over early Seattle and chuckling to himself. And he did that in part by collecting such wonderful details that suited his storytelling style and his sense of humor. So here's little examples of his, of his humorous touch. He describes Erastus Brainerd, Seattle's promoter during the gold rush, as a part-time genius. He describes another character as dressing like a retired pimp. His description of socialist activist Mary Kenworth Kenworthy ends with this line, she bought her bread from a baker who quoted Karl Marx. <laughs> he sums up an aging uh, Doc Maynard this way, so one more line about Doc Maynard here. Wow, the crowd's going wild. <laughs> uh, so this is, yeah, this is an old Doc Maynard here. Liquor became for Maynard less a stimulant than a consolation. He drank more than ever, but as he became an alcoholic, he regained much of his old popularity. He was an institution, and there was a probably pity in his popularity. Old Doc Maynard is a better doctor drunk than the rest of them are sober, the people said. But still, he did not prosper as a physician. He hated to send bills. <laughs> he, he accomplishes so much in so little space. Um, he throws in a, a, a dab of insightful uh, psychology at the perfect moment, like when he summarizes Thomas Burke's speech against the immoral eviction of the Chinese. Burke's speech may well have been the greatest ever made in the Puget Sound area, more powerful even than the legendary oration by Chief Self, but it did not save the Chinese. Indeed, it may have made violence inevitable. Nothing is so painful as truth told by a former friend. Nothing so infuriating as an unanswerable argument. And um, I, th I just thought that was wonderfully stated when, when people are suddenly confronted with the truth of what they're doing. Um, and uh, and he, uh, he reimagines the Seattle fire in 1889. If you, if you do nothing else, go back and look look at his description of the fire, because it takes him just about three pages to start with the, uh, 
with the pot of glue overflowing onto the floor into the, into the sawdust and mixing with the turpentine and, and, and how it goes right down the street and, and ignites all the barrels of whiskey and then the ammunition store. And, and, uh, and he bookends it with, with, a, with a guy um, getting a loan to, to purchase a business that is about to go up in flames. Um, so it just, I, I don't know, I guess what amazes me is that when I think most people write history, they, they write it somewhat tentatively. They, they weren't there, they didn't see it, they, they hedge on a lot of stuff, and Murray didn't seem to have those reservations. And I think in, in part that probably um, uh, some scholars probably took issue to it, that, that, he, that he wasn't heavily footnoted enough, that he, that he didn't... Uh, that he didn't kind of follow the rules of the game, and I think that was part of the charm of it, is that he, that he seemed to be having so much fun. And then to end this book, um, to bring it to a head with, with, the, with the story of Dave Beck, to me, strikes me as really a daring thing to do as a writer. It's not as if Dave Beck was a really charismatic figure. Does he everybody know who Dave Beck was? Yeah. He, the, uh, the big... The big uh, um, Teamsters union leader who became wasn't he the head of the National Teamsters right yeah but he um, but he he was somewhat of a bland safe uh, obtuse guy but but um, who who then just became uh, fatally corrupt but but Murray sees the the opportunity to kind of tell uh, to bring his whole story together and I need my glasses and so. Uh, here he is in this, this paragraph that just tries to pull the whole book together. Uh, okay. Dave Beck, executive vice president of the Teamsters and the dominant personality in present-day Seattle, is a plump and efficient businessman who cornered the local labor market during the 30s. He's a lot of other things, too. He is the poor boy who made good, the kid who had to quit high school to earn a living and is now president of a $3.5 million corporation. He is the man who took the Teamsters Union and made it into a better mousetrap. He is a self-made man, all right, and the finished product could have been turned out only in Seattle. Beck's pattern of thought, his conception of the role a labor leader should play, his ruthlessness, his ostentation, all are tinged by the Seattle experience, by the boom and bust of the gold rush days, by the corruption of the Gill administration, by the success of men like Considine and Pantages, and of other men like Jim Hill and Frederick Weyerhaeuser, by the toughness of the Wobblies, by the failure of the general strike. Um, so uh, those are some of my thoughts on, on why I think he's so terrific. And I just wanted to mention that uh, um, when I, when I contacted other authors to see what they thought about him, I got a lot of the same, same stuff. And, um, uh, you know, Tim Egan obviously uh, is a big fan of his. And then um, um, Jonathan Evison, a Bainbridge Island writer, has uh, studied his book, The Last Wilderness, before Jonathan wrote his novel about the uh, Olympic Peninsula. Uh, John Dodge is an Olympia writer. Um, who just wrote a book about the 1962 Columbus Day storm that, uh, that he read four of Murray's books before he wrote it just because he, he wanted to try to see if he couldn't get Murray in his bloodstream. And he, and he said, uh, um, of those four books, he said, they all helped me with the timber and texture of Pacific Northwest history that I was trying to bring to the book. The greatest compliment I can receive is when someone suggests my storytelling and treatment of community and place bear some resemblance to Morgan's. His writing is the standard by which I measure myself. It's, I was, it's interesting that you would bring up Erastus Brainerd because when I um, read about him, I thought of your main character in Truth Like the Sun. Mm. Erastus Brainerd was, he was a marketing genius. And when the Alaska Gold Rush happened, he decided that he was going to make the words Seattle and Alaska synonymous. I can't tell you how many things this guy did. I mean, he wrote to every editor at every newspaper all over the country. He would, um, you know, he con <laughs> contacted you know, congressional representatives. I mean, this was like, this is before, this is in the age of the telegraph. And this guy 
got it out there that if you wanted to go to Alaska, you had to go through Seattle. And so Jim wrote about a similar character, a guy who helped create the Seattle World's Fair. And it made me wonder if you could talk a little bit about how the boom and bust phenomenon that Seattle has gone through so many times has affected the city, both as interpreted by Murray's work and by your own. Um, well, um, let me first talk about Brainerd for a second because uh, he, I found him to be just an irresistible character. He, uh, my, my favorite uh, of his tricks was that he would, he would publish an article in the Saturday Evening Post or some publication about how Seattle was the only way to go and get to Alaska. And then he would write an article for some other uh, magazine and quote the, the Saturday Evening Post <laughs> and, and, and their great praise for, for the Seattle route. And um, so to me, he, he was like the... Um, the, the quintessential uh, Seattle salesman, and there's been so many Seattle salesmen along the way to to hype the city and to make and to make it happen and to make it grow and build. You know, starting with Doc Maynard, and I and I think that it's it's strangely um, in the bloodstream. And I and I didn't realize it as much until I lived in Portland for a while, which just has a very different makeup. Uh, Portland's always trying to look smaller than it really is, and 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 Seattle is always, you know, trying to get taller and higher and and uh, and more audacious in 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 my opinion. And so when I was trying to um, capture the World's Fair and the the audacity of having the World's Fair in Seattle, which was a tiny, uh, you know, second class city at the time, and to pull it off, it took a whole bunch of salesmanship. But that that's the nature of Seattle and, and the way that it snowballs though from from uh, the World's Fair to to putting up the Space Needle in in 300 days and and to you know people like Paul Allen saying that that growing up and looking at looking at the Space Needle anything seemed possible um, so it, it just seems to keep going. We've talked about a number of the characters in Skid Road. Lane, do you have one character that's that's particularly close to your heart? I probably have two. Remembering, thinking of when I read the book the first time, when I, I'm guessing I was 13, 14, teenager, anyway. I fell in love with Anna Louise Strong. She was someone in the book I could relate to because she was a girl and her politics were accessible and um, and uh, fit my, my budding worldview at that age. And I thought, this is someone conceivably, I'll probably never be that brave, but you never know. So she was one. And the other was maybe not as a character, but just as a story. I was crazy about the story of our longtime Lieutenant Governor Vic Myers. Um, just because it's so goofy and the idea that you could have this goofball um, episode that went on for years and years in a history book was cool to me I just <laughs> so those two stand out I think Anna Louie Strong was crazy maybe yeah yeah <laughs> definitely out there she was a um, a woman journalist who, during the Seattle general strike, managed to scare, scare everybody to death by writing these editorials that implied that the Bolshevik revolution was going to happen in the streets of Seattle. And, and she went on to, do, to a pretty distinguished career. She lived all over the world, wrote, oh. you know, for many publications, got in a lot more trouble. Yeah, She did indeed. Yeah, She did indeed. And if you read her editorial, I want to stand up for Anna Louise, it doesn't say it's very open-ended. It's scary in that sense. Mm -hmm. She says, we are marching down a road that leads no one knows where. And I remember that Murray said, although if you read the editorial, it doesn't say anything fire-breathing. It was taken as yes, no one knows true. where means straight to Moscow. Boom. Right, right. <laughs> Exciting times. 
How about you, Jim? You mentioned Brainerd. Yeah, no, I, I, I love Brainerd, but um, I'm going to use this as an uh, opportunity to, to talk about John Considine. Oh, I was going to do him. Uh, Sucks. Considine. Got it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> John Considine. Um, he... Uh, he he's such a interesting character the way he sets him up he he's running the 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 gambling joints and and uh and taking control of the nightlife but he but he dr just drinks cold water and uh is constantly chewing gum and uh and his whole storyline leads to to this this great climax and he still has a life after it but but a climax where where he's getting into a shootout with the um uh with the police chief and and it's just it's it's just a crazy good scene because the, the 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 fired police chief is coming for revenge and he's loaded up with with like five guns and a shotgun and uh, and he um, gets right close up to Considine and um, <laughs> and 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 uh, attempts to shoot him with the with the shotgun from two feet away and misses <laughs> and so and then um, uh, Considine ends up killing him and getting away with it. And uh, so that story. He was story tried long. for murder, but he was acquitted, right? He was acquitted yeah, and, yeah. and then did fabulously well afterwards. Yes, he, he went on to become a um, right. vaudeville impresario and got into show business in California. And his, was it his grandson was a star of My Three Sons? Tim Considine. Tim yeah. That's right. Hmm. Yeah. That scene, the shootout, I felt like I was watching a Robert Altman movie. That, that, that it's so good. I mean, it's almost like you're watching the whole thing in slow motion, and it's just this kind of comedy of errors, but it's totally deadly. Well, it, it made me wonder if, if um, Murray got his hands on new, more information, or if he was just taking a different uh, tact with old information. I mean... Did did other historians write about the you know the shootout and the fire with the same graphic excitement? Could, I don't know. Couldn't um, have done it as well, I don't think. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the legacy of the book, and then maybe we can open it up for questions or comments. Um, Lane, what was the legacy of publishing Skid Road for Murray and and for your family? Skid Road sold 10,000 copies in Seattle really fast. Wow, that and was a lot of books in those that days. That was a lot of books in those days, and that was a lot of books ever in our household. Um, you know, this is not, yeah, this is not New York Times bestseller land we're talking about. So that certainly made a, you know, a, it stabilized our rather rackety household, I think. And it gave him that feeling of we can go forward and see what else you can write with this kind of um, with this kind of approach. Marianne's actually absolutely right that a number of historians at the time that Skid Road came out said basically, well, we could have a good selling popular book too if we just made stuff up and you know added all this gratuitous color and Murray and Skid Row, the original Skid Row did not have an index and that was a, um, also an issue in the land of historians. Murray took his research very seriously and when I reread it I feel as though some of those conversations cannot have been something that he knows absolutely were said verbatim. But he said that he didn't write historical fiction because he felt that he couldn't write convincing dialogue. He had to have that factual grounding. He had to have that detailed kind of research in order to recreate scenes and mm -hmm. that he tried very hard never to make stuff up. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there are some lines in there. In the John Considine story, there's a thought balloon, what Considine was thinking as he went down the street. And I remember Murray said, no, that came from a letter. Uh -huh. huh. So wow. he said he was thinking those things. Um, but, you know, there must have been a little bit of wiggle room there. However, he took that part very seriously. Less in Skid Road, but more in the later books, you see a whole lot of physical description. 
and there's some in Skid Road. Um, Jim's absolutely right that he was very influenced by Steinbeck, and in particular, really, by his physical descriptions. If you haven't read um, Grapes of Wrath for a while, it has a chap, there'll be a short chapter of description, and then back to the story, and it goes back and forth like that. Um, Michael Sullivan told me something I hadn't known, which was that when he was doing newspaper research, which he did by the stack full, he would write down the weather in every day's paper if he was picking up other facts so that when he wrote the next vignette, he could say, it was a gloomy day with a spattering of rain and the mountain wasn't in view. If he says that, that's because the paper said that. Um, so he did, he took that seriously. You and I have exchanged a lot of emails over the course of um, bringing the book out again and uh, planning this event. And one thing we, we sort of teased on is if Murray had written the book today, what might he have added or what might he have left out? Do you have some opinions to share on that? Um, I have a quote. <laughs> He's, this is talking about, um, this is from an interview, and I'm sorry I don't remember which one, but it's at the time that Roger Sales' book about Seattle had come out in the mid-70s, late 70s? 76. 76, okay. And so these, and there, um, Skid Road kept coming out in new and updated editions. And he had an epic evening with Roger out at the house where he said that they stayed up talking and drinking until five or six in the morning and they kicked around their very different perspectives about Seattle and how you structure a history. And in regard to that, he told this interviewer, I've never tried to write a definitive history. I'm not convinced of the possibility of doing a definitive analysis of the past. I think that any analysis you make simply reflects the current mood of what is imparted in the past and would be changed for the next generation as such. Skid Road, as a thought about what Seattle's personality had been like up till the 30s, would not have been written in the 50s or 60s. It wouldn't have come out the same way. Nor do I imagine that 30 years from now, Roger Sale would write Seattle past to present the same way. So it would have been different. Um, and as you said, he was a white guy in 1951. And he's writing from that perspective, there's no doubt about it, where the times would have taken him, well, who knows? I don't know, we don't know, but it certainly would have been a different perspective, different hmm. little vision. And I want to say that um, Jim and I were emailing years ago, brief when we first got in contact, about Murray and about Roger. And he said, oh, I think of Roger as the, you may have to help me there, the something Easterner. Um, anyway, the part, the person from out of town who comes in and looks at this, this city and then the line that I just treasure, and then here's Murray, indigenous as a gooey duck. <laughs> 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 I love that line. I will thank you for it forever. Uh, I just wanted to say uh, one thing. When I was preparing to write that book, um, Truth Like the Sun, I... I, I, was, I toyed with the idea of having my protagonist have a old Seattle name like Yesler or something and then I thought that that seemed too hokey and I was so happy to come up with the idea of combining my two favorite Seattle historians, Roger Sale and Murray Morgan into Roger Morgan. Is that right? Is that right. what you so, did? So that was, that was my homage to them. Yeah. I can't believe I didn't notice that. But, but I, I just <laughs> wanted to... Uh, uh, try to give my two bits on on because I, I was I ended this book and I and I thought so what characters from modern Seattle would have amused Murray to the point of wanting to um, flesh them out and um, my only uh, idea is that I, I don't really care for them but the only ones that came to me was uh, uh, the the Bezos uh, the Bezos you know close in on his the arc of his life although he hasn't crashed yet, so that doesn't really work. Um, and then the, the other one um, was the, the uh, 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 your socialist uh, councilwoman. Or maybe, do you have more than one? <laughs> <laughs> I, it's hard to keep track, yeah. but yes, I, we've got at least one, yes. 
Well, I think I'd like to open it up to questions or comments. I know a lot of you here may have known Murray or have thoughts about the book. Um, since there are three of us, if you could address your question to the person you want to answer the question, and then I'm, for the sake of the TV, I'm going to ask the person who answers the question to repeat it and then answer it. Does that make sense? All right. David? So the question is, what was Skid Road's reception outside of Seattle and the Northwest? How was it perceived nationally? I don't know. Lane, do you know? I probably don't know, but I did read some when I was looking for insight on the beginnings of Skid Road. I looked through a clip book. So I am the daughter of a historian and a reference librarian. and. Um, so I have a lot of artifacts at home. And so I read through some of the national reviews and they tended toward the lusty and colorful, those natives out west. Lumberjacks, um, yes. You mean they don't live in igloos? And <laughs> is Seattle in Alaska? Uh, but a number of the reviews went past that to talk about the nature of regional history and why it's important for those of us in the real United States, east of the Mississippi, to understand what's going on in other parts of the country. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't a giant nation nationwide bestseller, but it um, mm -hmm. definitely was heard about. Never gone out of print. Never gone out of print. Mm -hmm. Right. Other thoughts? So the question is, where is the historical research preserved? Is it preserved? Where is it? And when you were working on your book, did you go back into it? I can do part one and two. Um, as per Murray's wishes, his research library and about, oh, 150 boxes of notes and manuscript material and other um, ephemera are at the Murray and Rosa Morgan room at the Tacoma Public Library. And scholars can access those. Um, it's still a work in progress to get very specific um, listings of them, but they're there. As far as how um, uh, Murray's work and, and the way I, 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 read, I, read his, I read his book, but I didn't, I didn't track down his research material. I wasn't writing about the time frames that he, that he was writing about. Um, and and in general, I, I just I liked his spirit. What I took away was his was his spirit, and and part of it was, and I mean this helped me with earlier books too. Is just that um, I think it's hard to think of where you grew up as an extraordinary place. It's just where you grew up, but I'd always felt that this was an extraordinary landscape and an extraordinary people, and and Murray kind of gave me the confidence that I that I could write as such. Yes. So the question is, did the available material influence who Murray chose to write about? Absolutely. Um, there are notes, starting manuscripts and notes about people and aspects of history that he wanted to do but couldn't find enough to back it up. Um, 
you know, avenues that petered into dead ends, a few of which have opened up later and are showing up on History Link, because <laughs> um, that's Kit Oldham from History Link. And um, mostly newspapers, as time goes on, of course, and you get a reputation, people give you stuff, so letters and other things would come to him. In the early days, there were, um, you know, more chances for face-to-face -face discussions with people who lived some of that history. Um, there's a vignette in Puget Sound where Murray remembers that as a kid he met Ezra Meeker, who is the famous Puyallup pioneer. There's an Ezra Meeker house and he came out on the wagon train and he was the epitome of the old, old Oregon Trail old timer when those of us who grew up in Washington studied it. Well, Murray met him at his dad's house. He and his dad were friends. So in this country where history is recent, if you were born in 1916, you knew some of these folks. Um, one thing I'd like to highlight is that, that Lane has posted a lot of Murray's and Rose's correspondence on a blog. I mention it in the foreword. Um, his letters are wonderful. I mean, there are letters that go back to uh, when he was posted in the Aleutians, when they go on their long uh, European trip. I mean, all the way through his life, and he was always just an incredibly vivid writer, even if he was just writing to a friend. So, I'll get back to you. There's somebody back here. Yes. Can you speak up just a little bit? Can you speak up a little bit? Or come closer? So can you repeat the question? Um, he was asking if Murray had thought about writing about people or places further afield mm -hmm. um, than this area, Puget Sound and, and the region. His first nonfiction book was about the Aleutians, and he wrote it when he was in the Aleutians, um, stationed in, on several islands on the chain in, in 44 and 45. So there's that. Uh, he wanted to call it um, those goddamn illusions. It came out first as Bridge to Russia, and that became a not great selling <laughs> title um, as the years went by, and so it was brought out again in the 70s as Islands of the Smoky Sea. <coughs> now, didn't he write a mystery set in Mexico? He wrote uh, his first book, written under a suit, it, written with his middle name and his first name, was a mystery set in Mexico. Um, his third book was a mystery set in Grace Harbor, which is actually a pretty good book, um, The Viewless Winds, mm -hmm. at least. Um, and it's about the still unsolved Laura Law murder mystery. Ooh. She was the wife of a union activist in um, Hoquiam. Mm -hmm and during a uh, replete with conflict union period. Hmm. Um, he really did, when he was writing his own projects, he decided he wanted to focus on the Northwest. But he was a working freelancer with a living to make, and he wrote all sorts of magazine pieces about other things, and he wrote a book um, for hire about the World Health Organization, which sent us around Central and South America and sent him to Africa in 1957, so it has a lot of descriptive writing and vignettes about those places. But when he could control his own book writing destiny, he wrote about here. Let's do one more question and then we can carry on the conversation. We're gonna have some libation somewhere. Every available space is filled at the moment, but I'm sure our trusty folio crew will figure that out. Dave? All right, okay. Okay, David, you want to have the last word? Yeah, it was in the early 1970s that 
that one of the descendants of David Maynard made public the letters that Maynard had written back to his son. And there were about 30 or 40 letters. And I can remember being at the event where Murray was, and he said, I would have given my right arm to have mm -hmm. access to these letters. But the amazing thing was, was when you read David Maynard's deep and involved and emotional letters to his children, um, it, it's very much the man that Murray described. So even without those letters, Murray managed to capture the, the heart of the man. I thought that was amazing. Maynard did keep a journal on the Oregon Trail, yeah. and oh, it's that's pretty a brief, Oh, it's wonderful. But it does give you a feel for the man there, and some of it may have been extrapolated from that. Where but I, I don't know. It's referenced in, in Skid Road, and I don't know where he found it. Wow. <laughs> All right. Ask well, Jeannie Fisher if anybody can winkle it up. If it's in Tacoma, she probably knows. Yeah, she works for the Seattle Archives now. All right. Well, we'll continue the secrets of the historian's conversation. Thank you so much for coming. It's just been such a pleasure. Thanks. <laughs>